Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful for this time together. We are thankful for your place in our lives, for our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, the one who guides us and watches over us. Lord, we pray that we would open our hearts and minds to your word, to your, to your thoughts that, uh, that will be spoken this morning. I pray that my words would reflect your truth, that, that my words would, would be your words, Lord, that my words would encourage and uplift our congregation today. So we ask your blessing upon us, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a minister who was in his study, and he was typing away, writing his sermon. And while he was doing this, he, his little daughter walked in, and she was watching her dad for, for a little bit, and, and she watched him as he typed. And, but every once in a while, she noticed that he would, he would hit the delete key, and then he would type some more. And every once in a while, he'd hit the delete key, and then he'd type some more. And so finally, his, his little girl said, Daddy, I, I have a question for you. Yes, sweetie, what do you want? She said, what are, what are you doing? I'm watching you type, but what, what are you typing? And the father said, oh, well, I'm typing my sermon. Oh, okay. And she thought for a moment, and then she said, well, how, how do you know what to write in your sermon? And her father said, well, God gives me the words, and then I write them down. Again, she thought and she then looked at her dad and he said, well, daddy, if God gives you the words, then, then why do you have to erase them sometimes? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? If God gives us the words, why do we have to erase them sometimes? If God gave us our life, then why does God have to rework us sometimes? Well, I think the answer should be clear. The answer is that we have sin in our lives, right? We don't always do things right. Just like the kids when they're trying to practice their letters, right? And they don't get them quite right and they have to rework them over and over again, right? God wants to rework our lives. We are not perfect. PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's try that again. There we go. That's the right one. So God created us and given us life. Then how come he needs to make changes? Well, we know that, that sin is in our life and we're not perfect. And, and we have to be reworked on and on again, right? When I first met Tammy, some of you might not know, some of you might know that when she was, before she was married, she was a professional golfer. She was really, she is still a pretty good golfer. She would say she's not nearly as good a golfer as she used to be, but she was a professional golfer. Well, when I started playing golf, I just had a friend that said, well, here, this is kind of how you do it. And he showed me a few things and I grabbed a golf club and I went out and I started playing. So when I met Tammy, my game was not good. I had some bad habits and those bad habits would sometimes get me into like difficult situations playing golf. <laughs> You know, I don't know if you've ever had a difficult uh, shot like this, those of you who play golf. But when you have bad habits, your bad habits can get you into really bad places when you play golf, right? So Tammy had to break these bad habits. She had to rework my swing so that I would do better. Now, I don't have anywhere near a perfect golf game, but my golf game has improved significantly. And at least I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't always do it, but I know what I'm supposed to do. And isn't that what the Christian life is about? We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't always do it. So therefore, we need God to rework us. Jeremiah 18, 3-4. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. This story happened about 700 BC, about 700 years before Jesus came to this earth. And it's a wonderful visual of God's plan for his people, how he needs to rework us time and time again. Now, I don't know if you know anything about a potter's workshop, but, but it's pretty simple. It, it usually has a, a potter's wheel, 
It has a chair for the potter to sit on. It has water for the clay and it has lots of clay. And so there the potter is and he's sitting there. And of course, if you remember back in, in times of Jesus' day, the potter was making things that were for everyday use, right? The, the plates and the, the cups, they were all for everyday use. And, and so his, his job was important. He was making things that everybody would be using. It needed to, to be good quality. He had to be skilled in what he did. Now, the Hebrew word for wheel, when you think of a potter's wheel, is ha'abnayim. And it literally means two stones, two stones that were connected together with this vertical axle. And the, the potter would, would move this, this wheel with a, with a pedal at his feet. And he'd move the wheel, and with his hands, he would shape the pottery. And it took effort and, and focus and skill to make the pottery. Just as the potter has high expectations for, for what he's making. So God has high expectations for you and for me. When he created us, he created us with these high expectations, right? I mean, remember back in Genesis 1, it says that God made humans in his image. He made them special and important. And when he was done creating man and woman, he said, they are good. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 139.4, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created us good and he has high expectations for us. But we still need to be reworked because of our sin. The Bible tells us that we are created to rule the earth to care for this earth that God created. The Bible tells us that we're to be in relationship with one another and to, to be in relationship with God. The Bible tells us that we're to work together to make this world a wonderful place. We are the church, the body of Christ. And the church is to be God's presence and God's power in the world. Now, these are some high expectations that God has for us. See, the problem, though, is that oftentimes we don't have high expectations for ourselves. Maybe we get frustrated. Maybe we get overwhelmed. Maybe we get down. And so our expectations of ourselves go down, right? We might say something like, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not gifted enough, or I don't have enough money, or I don't have the right resources, or I don't have the skill, I don't have the means. Right now, my, my body isn't working right, or my mind isn't working right. And, and so we make these excuses, and we say, you know, I can't do it. And our, our expectations are not that high. I mean, if you look at the world, I think you would agree with me that the world is far from perfect, right? There is a lot of problems in our world. We see disease and pollution and conflict, war and selfishness. So how can we fulfill these high expectations that God has for us? How can we do what God expects? Well, the key is to see ourselves with the capabilities that God has for us, to see ourselves as God sees us. That's why Jesus constantly is saying, he who has eyes to see, we need to see like God sees, right? And that includes seeing ourselves created in the image of God. And in this way, we can live up to the high expectations that God has for us because God empowers us to do it. And so our first point is that we are to be thankful that God has high expectations for us. The truth is we do fail, fail to measure up. And there's really two reasons why we fail to measure up. And it might surprise you what these two reasons are. See, when you look at the pottery, it not only needs to look good, but it needs to function well, right? It needs to function for its purpose that it was created. If it slumps to one side, if it's cracked, if it's fragile, it will be destroyed and it will be remade. Now, fortunately for us, God is not so concerned with what he sees on the outside, but he's concerned with our hearts. 
We have been created by God, and God says, I want your heart to be like my heart. I want you to love like I love. That's why it's the first commandment is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Because as we love God and we receive God's love, then we can love as God loves. In 1 Samuel 7, 16, or 1 Samuel 7, 7, Samuel was charged by God to go and to find a new king. And so he went to find the king, and he was sitting there, and one person after another was brought to him. And these, these men that were brought before him, they, they were good-looking, they were, they were tall, they were strong. And in Samuel's mind, is like, every one of them looks like a king. He'd represent the kingdom well. But every time God said, no, 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 that's not the right person, no. And he explained to Samuel why. He says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then finally, David comes before him. David is short in stature. He's rough looking. He doesn't look like a king. And God says, that is the one who is going to be the next king because he has the heart that I desire. He is the one who can serve me well. If you want to serve God well, then work on your heart. It is your heart that is important. And God will continually rework your heart to love what he loves and, and to be able to desire to do what he wants you to do. And so the first reason why we might fail to measure up is because we have a misunderstanding of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. In our sin, we keep ourselves from the high expectations of God. In our sin, we keep ourselves from having a thankful heart. In our sin, we lose perspective of what God has for us in this world, in our life. Our sin keeps us from fulfilling how God can work in and through our lives for what we are created to do. But there's a second misunderstanding, and the second misunderstanding is we misunderstand what God wants. We work hard to, to look good physically, right? I think most of us have taken a little bit of time this morning to, to look good, right? So we can present ourselves well for others around us. We work hard to, to get a good job. We work hard for what we think is, is supposed to be good. And usually that is what the, the world oftentimes says is good, right? And we strive for these things. But God says, I don't care about those things. I'm not concerned about that. What is God concerned about? Micah 6, 8. He has told you what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. These are are the things of the heart. As we're talking about beacon light and the, and the clothing drive and, and the first fruits, as we're talking about this, this is the things of the heart, right? The way we, we serve God and we're faithful to God. These are the things of the heart. Loving people who are hurting, encouraging people who are struggling, helping people who are feeling lost, sharing the gospel with people who don't know Jesus. These are the things of the heart. These are the expectations that God has for us on our lives. I'm so thankful that God's expectations are different than the world's. Because when our heart is right, then everything else will flow from that. And so our second point is that we should be thankful that God looks at the heart. So with this in mind, we understand that the potter looks at the pottery. And when it's not quite right, he wants to rework it. And so God looks at us and, and he sees that, that things are not quite right. And so he wants to rework those in our lives. It's not because God doesn't love us anymore. It's not because God doesn't have any use for us anymore. It's actually the opposite. It's because God wants to use us. It's because God wants 
and God does love us, and he wants us to be the people he created us to be. Bernard of Clairvaux, a Benedictine monk, once said, So then, as long as I'm not united to God, I'm divided within myself and at perpetual strife within myself. Now, this union with God can only be secured by love, and the subjection to him can only be grounded in humility. And the humility can only be the result of knowing and believing the truth. That is to say, having the right notions of God and of myself. Now, in the case of the potter, the clay is remixed together and it, it's the, the whole work is started over. Fortunately for us, God doesn't start over. He, he says, no, what I've created, I've created you and, and that's good and we're gonna, that's what we're going to work with and we're going to continue to move forward with who I've created you to be. I'm not going to make you someone else. You're still going to be you. You're just going to be more of the you that I created you to be, right? Where we worked and we continue to live. And God molds us and shapes us why we live. And so because we have a will, we have a mind, we have our own desires, we have to humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, I am willing to let you rework me. We have to humble ourselves before the Lord and say, God, I am going to work with you as you rework me. I'm going to be a part of this process with you. And so we are reworked by God so we can be in a place to worship God, to shine God's glory, and to help others around us. That's what God desires for us in our lives. There's a story of Napoleon. His ship is out on the Mediterranean, and it's a, a clear night. The stars are out. Napoleon's walking along the deck, and he overhears some of his men mocking God, saying, there, how can there be a supreme being? That's, that's a ridiculous thought. And so Napoleon stopped and he looked at his men and he said, I want you to look up for a moment. Look up. See all those stars? If you're going to deny a supreme being, then first of all, you have to explain all of that. The God who created all creation created you and created me. For a purpose. As you look in your life, I think it's easy for you to say to yourself, I'm not perfect. Do you realize that you need some reworking? Are you really, are you willing to say, God, I want you to rework me. I want you to work in and through my life. I want to be that person you created for me to be, the person I would be if sin had not gotten a hold of my life. Should we be thankful that we have a creator that loves us that much, that cares so much about us, that he wants to make us better and better all the time? Should we be thankful that God wants to help us rise above our sin so that we don't desire to sin, but we desire to do the righteous works of God? Shouldn't this be our response? So our third point is that we should be thankful that God will rework us. Well, we heard our, our scripture reading from Luke 17. And in this passage, it's a story about the lepers, the ten lepers. But I want to point out something before I talk about that story. And that is that when Jesus was here on earth, he didn't heal everyone who needed healing. Right? So, so often we think that physical healing is like super important, right? But there's something more important. And this is why Jesus did what he did. John 20, 30 to 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The miracles that Jesus did, the signs that Jesus did, the healing that Jesus did had a purpose. And the purpose was so that people would see that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh, come to save people from their sins. 
He believed and he knew that the healing of our soul, the healing of our sins, the forgiving of our sins was far more important than the healing of our physical bodies. Because the healing of our soul, giving us salvation, is what impacts us eternally. While the healing of our physical body only benefits us some while we're here on this earth. You know, a lot of times people would come to Jesus and they'd ask him for healing. And the first thing he would say to them was not, you're healed. The first thing he would say oftentimes would be, your, your, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. That was the first thing he would say because he knows that was the need. That was what was deep in, in our need is, this, is the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing of our sins, the, the giving us salvation. And so we come to this, this passage in Luke 17 and the lepers are there and they're calling out to Jesus, Master, Master, please heal us. Have mercy on us and heal us of our leprosy. And Jesus came to them and he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. He didn't even say, you are healed. He said, go and show yourself to the priests. Why did he do that? Well, first he did that because in Jesus' time, if someone was to be declared healed, they had to go to the priest and the priest had to declare them healed, especially if they had leprosy because they had been put out by their leprosy. And the priest would say, yes, you're healed. You can come back into society. But secondly, and more importantly, because when Jesus said that, go and show yourself to the priests, by standing or by walking and going, what were they doing? They were showing faith, weren't they? They're saying, I believe that as I go, that I will be healed, just as Jesus said. And the scripture tells us that they began to walk and they were healed. But then we get to the interesting part of this passage. We read in 15 to 16, one of them came back, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. Praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And then we see that phrase, and he was a Samaritan. If you're familiar with Jesus' time, you know that Samaritans and Jews didn't get along with each other. They didn't like each other. In fact, they were enemies of each other. And so here we have this Samaritan who's healed, and he comes back, and what does he do? He humbles himself before Jesus, who is a Jew, a Samaritan humbling himself before a Jew. What an amazing sight this must have been, but he did this because he was thankful. The healing led him to believe in Jesus. Jesus did a reworking of his man, cleansing him from his leprosy, but even more importantly, cleansing his soul and drawing him into a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And the man showed thanks. But he was the only one. He was the only one. What happened to the other nine? They didn't return. They didn't come back and give thanks to Jesus. And Jesus makes mention of this. When he says in verses 17 to 18, he says, this man was a foreigner, meaning that the other nine were Jews. Could it be that as Jews, as God's people, God's chosen people, they had this expectation that Jesus should heal them. And when we have an expectation that someone is going to do something for us, when they do what we expect them to do, we're not thankful for it, right? Because we expected them to do it. We tend not to act in thanks because of it. And so our fourth point is that we are to be thankful for what Jesus does for us. Jesus is regularly doing things in our life, no matter where we are in life right now, no matter what's going on around us. Here we go. No matter what's going on around us, we are to be thankful for what Jesus is doing in our life. We're doing a three-week series. This is week two of, week of a three-week series on being thankful. And I don't want us to just be thankful during these three weeks. I don't want us to just be thankful when Thanksgiving Day comes and we say, okay, this is the day. You know, let's go around the table. What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? Right? And we say thanks, right? 
I don't even want it to be the month of November. I want us to be the kind of Christ followers where we are thankful for God, for his work, for his place in our life, for who he is, for his creating us, for his redeeming us, for his sustaining us. I want us to be thankful each and every day. Do you expect things, God to do things in your life? I mean, is that the way you pray, that you pray in a way that you expect God to do it, so if and when God does it, you're not thankful for God's work? Are you humbling yourself before God and saying, God, I need you to rework me each and every day. I want to be better and better for you. I want to be the kind of person you created me to be. Don't be like the nine lepers who failed to return to Jesus to give thanks. Be like the one who came and humbled himself before God, who gave praise to God, and who gave thanks for his healing. In fact, on the count of three, I want us to give thanks to God. On the count of three, I want us to say, thank you, God, for reworking me. Again, thank you, God, for reworking me. Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, God, for reworking me.